live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Wine Shark Wednesday with me, your host, Wine Shark. Uh, how is everybody this week? Hope we're getting through this hot Texas weather. If you're one of my locals down here, getting through it all pretty well together. I had to brave it to go out today for various reasons, and it was not fun. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. It was just, you know... I'm not missing the August. I'm just, just going to say that right there. And this is that part where maybe sheltering in place is naturally a part of August. We should do it all the time. That should be a thing. But yeah, uh, it's been a pretty good week here. We've been doing some upgrades and progress and wine shark stuff. Uh, I've been working on scripts today for uh, more stuff on hard seltzer for the wine drinking crowd. That's going to be coming up soon. A little mini series. And I was uh, talking to a friend of mine today as well. Came up with some good ideas for some new content for wine for non-wine drinkers. Um, not suggesting that they start drinking the beverage, but let's say you happen to be a person who does not drink or you know, and just don't like wine, but you still want to know some basic knowledge to be able to entertain or you know, not embarrass yourself at a restaurant, things like that. Um, so I'm going to frame that around the idea of, hey, you may not put this stuff in your mouth, but here's some basics to know on how to navigate the uh, what can be perceived as confusing wine world. So those are uh, upcoming topics. It'll be kind of cool and interesting. So uh, I'm excited about those. Um, interesting wine news as far as things are going. Uh, caught wind of an article that... Uh, 13 U.S. senators have approached and sent a, via via note via sending a, a message to uh, the U.S. Trade Rep Office to uh, get the wine tariffs removed, which have been ongoing now for 10 months, and we've talked about it on this show. But it was a bipartisan group of 13 different senators trying to basically say, "Hey, tariffs are stupid, and they're just hurting American consumers, and they're just hurting American businesses, especially in this current time." So. Hey, it's Miss Hops. Welcome. And you're not on duty. Well, all right. Well, then, Shannon, I expect you're going to need to get yourself a glass of wine for this show because, well, there's going to be some of that humor involved. And today we're going to be drinking uh, The Criminal on the uh, the uh, wine grocery store grab. Uh, I did not show off the bottle earlier. We're going to uh, joke about these. Hey there, Miss Donna. Hey, Miss Barbara. My mom, how are we doing? So anyway, yeah, lots of cool stuff. Um, the whole anti-tariff thing, very cool. Um, other news that trade groups are also starting to brace for escalation. This problem is going to get worse uh, because the EU is expecting to win a WTO uh, approval to do their own retaliatory tariffs uh, because of subsidies for the U.S. plane maker Boeing. So if you remember, this whole tariff issue was about the WTO saying, yes, uh, Airbus is being given preferential treatment over there and bad on you, Europe. Yes, the U.S. can do bad things. So tit for tat and plane for plat. We are apparently going to sit here in a trade war over planes that we're going to that's going to recognize itself in the wine world, which is dumb. Oh, man, it's dumb. So anyway, just uh, another instance of people messing with your mojo um, all because Somebody doesn't like the way they run their airline. Well, their air build their, their airplane building company. Uh, other news: next week we should we see the launch of the new contest. Um, I finally got I think the infrastructure in place to do the thing that I want to do. So we're going to do a contest for a free online virtual tasting uh, for up to ten connections. So you and 10 to 20 of your friends could have a cool online party. You can have me all to yourself at a Zoom meeting with a private wines of your choice in a very cool, uh, you know, basically just your own private Idaho of awesome. So uh, that'll be something fun. We're going to use it to help expand the channel and get the word out, share Wine Shark with all of our friends, that kind of thing. So that's uh, news from the news desk. But uh, today's topic we're going to be talking about wine flaws again. We've talked about Brett. We've talked about oxidization. Uh, but now it's the time to talk about wine cork taint. Or as it says in my book, Flawless, the musty taint problem. So if your taint is musty, we're going to talk about how to fix it. We're going to talk about wine flaws and the entire thing. And we're going to do it our best without giggling if we can. Because, well... 
let's just admit it. We're all kind of 12 years old somewhere in our heart. And well, saying the word taint is funny. I'm not going to lie. So uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about the, the basic concept. Uh, this is probably one of the uh, easiest to understand wine flaws that are out there. We've got uh, two, uh, two basic chemicals. What, in other words, first off, what is it? What is cork taint? When I say that word, um, what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is the chemical intrusion of two particular chemicals into wine, uh, TCA and TCB. Uh, 246-trichloroanisol and 246-tribromoanisol are two chemical compounds that can occur in your wine. And what happens is those particular smells we are very sensitive to, and the smells can override and basically dominate your palate in a very ugly way. Uh, when I say musty, the most common descriptor for uh, cork taint is either a uh, wet cardboard or a dank cellar or uh, sometimes we've heard, you may heard as here it's called mousy or uh, uh, there's there's several other minor descriptors, but most common it's that wet cardboard, wet dog uh, kind of kind of smell. As you can imagine, none of those things sound like you want to put them in your mouth. Now, despite that, as I've trained you guys uh, over many shows, just because it smells one way doesn't mean it's going to taste that way. However, cork taint is specifically very disruptive because it overrides those fruit flavors. It keeps us from getting to what the wine smells like in the, in the good, uh, and it steals away uh, that presence of those chemicals, steal away a lot of the fruit-forward flavors that we are here to enjoy in the first place. So that sucks. So uh, how does it happen? How, do we, how does this chemical uh, become part of our wine drinking experience? Answer is, it's a usually a microbial issue. Most oftentimes from the cork itself, however, it can be part of uh, hygiene issues within the winery. Uh, in other words, even if your cork was clean, you might get something where, the, where during the bottling process, there was some sort of uh, lingering uh, bacterial issue that we would have. Uh, so it might be my bestie six year old has learned that the word tang and will not let yeah, let it go. I'll be lying. And you said it was well, it's true, Reba. I can imagine that 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 you know if that's if, if you're gonna swear by something. So anyway. Um so frequency, in other words, how how often is this a problem in your wine world? How much how you know what is we talk about uh, you know cork taint and wines. How how often is, how often does it happen? Uh, it varies. Industry will often under underestimate it. Uh, consumers tend to overestimate it. But in a scientific study that was uh, sampled like a thousand bottles over three years of, of a specific wine tasting event, uh, they basically came to a, a statistically probable conclusion of, of, of pretty reasonable accuracy that it's about five to 8% of modern wines uh, that can, can, can end up with this problem. So that's not insignificant, right? I mean, that's one bottle in 20 on the low side. Uh, so, you know, if you're wine, your wine at a case of the time, or you drink wine fairly often running into a, 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 a cork taint issue is something you're going to have to be aware of. It's going to happen to you. Don't feel bad. We're going to get through this together. So when this little bugger goes wrong, when something happens to your, to your cork, um, how do you detect it? Right. What is, what am I looking for to, to, to understand? Right. Well, uh, the first thing to do is visual inspection of the bottle and the cork itself when you're looking to open your wine. Um, for instance, is the cork in bad shape? Is it dried? Is it loose in the neck? Is it deteriorating and crumbling? That can give you pause for a lot of different wine flaws. Okay. In other words, a cork that's not in good, healthy cork condition, right? It's not springy. It should be, sp it should be springy. It should have nice, nice bit of give to it. It should be still moist and feel like, you know, feel like squeezy cork. Uh, and it should be not crumbling or falling apart. Okay. So if that happens, be on the lookout, be already on the alert. However, wine can be tainted with a perfectly normal looking cork. Okay. So visual inspection isn't going to be the only thing you need to do. It just is a good way to look to see if a bottle perhaps has been mishandled or misstored. Um, something you also might want to look for is if the if the cork is coming out of the bottle more than the level of the the the, the, the edge of the neck. So if it start if it's slightly raised, that can indicate bad things are going on in the bottle, um, exposure to temperatures, things like that. 
Um, so those are also warning signs. But the preeminent way of discovering cork taint is that which you've seen. If you've ever been to a fancy restaurant and ordered a bottle of wine and the waiter comes by and he waves the cork underneath his nose. That is the, your smell, the sense of smell is your key defense line against uh, tainted wines, against cork taint. The reason is, is because we are very sensitive, and I mean very, very sensitive to the particular uh, chemical compounds we're talking about with TCA and TCB. Um, I mean, we're talking about that. So you get that wet cardboard, but musty smell, you're like, okay, wait a minute, something's wrong here. And once, once you smell this, it will tend to stick in your memory and you will not forget this. You will not mistake this for other wine flaws almost ever because it's so glaringly apparent. Um, if you've ever had a chance to be in one of my classes where we've had a, a, a corked bottle and it has happened on multiple occasions, I, tr I look at that as a blessing for the teaching purposes. It's a bummer that the wine is bad, but it's great because it helps people understand, hey, this is what I'm talking about. And I let everybody smell the cork versus a regular cork. And so they can get the difference. I let them smell it in the glass and really get an understanding of what it is that that's that warning sign we're looking for. So um, smelling that cork, you, we, the sensitivity level for this is something in the line of four nanograms per liter. Okay. That is a very tiny amount. That's literally about five parts per trillion. Five parts per trillion. It's like trying to find a Where's Waldo thing where Waldo's the only person on fire in the entire planet. Yep, that's the guy. Okay, it's very, very easy to understand once you know once you once you smell it, you're very easy, very likely to identify it. Um, note that it is tradition in and that it is a part of the service standard that your waiter or sommelier is the one waving the cork underneath their nose, not you, the guest. When they present this to you at a nice restaurant table, what they'll do is they'll often open up the thing and they will basically present you with the cork. Um, if they're doing it really by the, by the book, they'll have a little silver serviette at the table where they'll set it. They don't set this on the table. One does not set trash upon one's guest table, but you set this on that little serviette. And what they're doing there is they're showing you that the cork is indeed from the bottle you ordered. It's a, it's basically a, a look at, uh, to make sure that the wine has not been recorked and that they're not scamming you. Okay. So that is a, an older tradition regarding making sure that the, uh, that the cork and the, and the wine match up. So you're not being scammed. However, it's not like they're presenting you the hope diamond. You don't need to fondle it. You don't need to smell it. You need to leave it there. You need to nod politely. And if you really, you know, want you can tell the waiter that he can take it away because you don't need this thing afterwards because you're going to commit to drinking the whole bottle like an adult there. I said it. So anyway, um, also, the answer is no, I will not come smell your cork from you uh, for you at your home. That is not my sommelier's job, but I will see you all see me at shows. You will see me proofing the wines before this, uh, before I go. Uh, so the, the other question, is it always a flaw? When we talked about Brett and oxidization, and I, we haven't talked yet about reduction, um, but we talk about those, Brett specifically, is a questionable or, or is a debatable flaw, depending on certain people like the, the types of flavors that Britannomyces bring to the table. Certain people don't. So some people don't consider it an always flaw. This is the easy one. Cork taint is basically universally bad. It's, it's just bad. It's bad for you. Bad tasting. It's no good. There's, there's, you know, it's one of those few examples of just a pure flaw of known bad. And uh, actually, with the frequency with which it occurs, it's most often one of the things that I will teach in a class first. That if I was to teach a class on strictly broken wines, how to recognize them, how to avoid them, and how not to get your impressions wrong because of them, the answer is cork tank comes first because it's so easy to detect and so universally bad. So then the question, can I fix it? The answer is Sadly, no, not really. You need to toss it. Now, you may have seen or heard uh, either, you know, read, read somewheres on the internet, heard rumor, heard tell, you know, chatting around the old fireside somewhere that you can remove uh, cork taint via cling wrap. And this is one of those interesting sort of true rumors. Uh, University of California, Davis, which is one of the most renowned schools of viticulture and ethnography on the planet. Uh, some of the scientists there made a, a claim and did some testing on polyethylene plastic bonding with trichloroanisole or anisole bonds. Okay, so TCA, TCB. 
that's and and in other words, ba- what you would do is you would take the wine and you'd take a, a basically a ball of cellophane and you'd crunch it up, crunch up the cellophane, put it in the and put it through the cling wrap in the in the wine. You'd pour the wine off, and then that TCA would stick to that, moderately getting your wine back to a drinkable level. Well, while that is true, it is no longer f- it is no longer true. Rather, polyethylene plastic is really not very common in today's cling wraps. In other words. It's not that it wasn't well, it wasn't accurate. It's that the, the tools that we now have available, generally speaking, aren't going to work to serve the purpose. So I wouldn't recommend trying to save it. I would simply say, nope, you got to count that one as as a dead Indian, and it's just out. You're gonna there it is. Sorry, but we lost that one in the fight, and we're gonna have to open up a second bottle because it's better that way. Now, I will warn you here. This is one of those things that, especially when we're talking about holding on to wine for special occasions, especially if a wine has had a lot of time in the bottle or it's, you know, or, or, and it's using natural cork, the opportunities for this thing to happen do increase with time. Therefore, be prepared with that second, third bottle that I talked about. When I talked about in the video, in fact, I'll put a link up above um, to the video. Um, we talk about storing storage strategies and tactics. I always recommend that you have a backup when you're opening up a bottle that's been sitting around for, say, more than five years, simply because you're you're ensuring that if one went bad, perhaps the second tire wasn't flat too, right? Uh, and at the very least, if it's good, the great news is now you've got another one in backup that you could enjoy either at the same time or shortly thereafter. So there's no downside to it other than the investment in wine and storage space. There you go. Uh, but well, so people often ask, well, what about insert other method of closure here? What about screw caps? What about, you know, glass corks? What about fake cork? What about, you know, whatever it is you know, we did. In fact, I did a whole video on cork types. One of the first videos we did here. I will link it back above. Um, the answer there is you got to remember what the pros and cons of cork are. This cork taint is its major con. It's the major downside from a consumer-based perspective. But there's still a lot of other advantages that come along with cork, with, particularly with breathability and ageability. No other closure at this time is being consistently used to, in the fine wine world to have wines get better with age. Okay, So you're going to have to fit, confront the, the, the cork problem if you drink any wine that is of a reasonable pedigree. Um, Sure, our day-to-day wines might be use might use faux corks or stub enclosures, you know, screw caps or whatever, but that's not the ones that we're laying down for long terms and posterity. So you're just you're gonna eventually you're going to run across wine that has this. You need to be forearmed with that knowledge so that you can do things right. So how do you avoid it? Is the other you know usual question. How can I avoid having uh, corked wine? Well, uh, the two things we're looking for primarily here are primary storage on the part of the retailer and prime and proper storage on your part. So how the wine is stored and where you shop is actually very important. Um, it depends on, again, it all depends on the level we're shopping at. You know, we're here in a minute going to talk about grocery store wines. You really don't have a lot of control over grocery store wines, but grocery stores are a perfect example of a not really particularly good for your wine environment. Fluorescent light is not good for them. Um, it's not as bad as UV light or sunlight, but it's still not good in the long run. The good news is they don't tend to be there for the long run. Wines tend to move pretty quickly um, in those stores. That's one of the things they're looking for um, as a product, and it's one of the reasons why they love for you to become one of their card members so they can see how much wine is moving uh, and to whom uh, and all the other, and whether you buy, you know, whether you're buying baby formula or whether you're just buying lots and lots of wine, which, you know, they can indicate to you is a great marketing opportunity. So uh, to say the least, the proper storage on their part is something to consider, but mostly as we get up the price point and price scale. Boutique wine shops, etc., ought to have consideration for this. If they've got any kind of control over their space, their wine shouldn't be stored anywhere where it's getting direct sunlight. Um, it should be incandescently lit if possible or the pri- or you know now these days you know it's you stay away from fluorescence and get into the right te- color temperature range. I'd actually be very interested in finding out new light studies when it comes to things like LEDs and uh, other other brands uh, or sorry other flavors of uh, of light wavelengths because what which ones of those cause light strike? Normally it's in that higher uh, smaller wavelength type things like you, you know UV rays rather than IR rays. 
So be very interested to see that. Now, the same thing applies. Once you own the product, you have to care for it too. Okay. Keeping it out of the light, keeping it, you know, keeping the cork so that they're in contact with the wine so that they stay moist. All of those tricks and trays that we talked about in the storage video apply here. You got to care for that wine so that it doesn't have problems. Now, the bad part is all of this is underpinned by one, one keystone in the pyramid, and that is good luck. If the potential for spoilage is there, there's very little you can do to detect it, and there's very little you can do to prevent it. But you can do your best to stop the, the you know corks from easily going bad. Um, this is that thing where you know if you if you store them properly and have good cellar hygiene, you're not you know you're going to get what you're going to get. And hopefully the winery did a good job at keeping their uh, keeping their hygiene up about making sure that they use quality cork that is that is well cleaned and ready for the bottle at that time of bottling. So. Awesome. But that's, so that's, that's your, that's how to keep your taint from becoming musty um, and what to do with it if you had. So uh, any questions so far, a little bit of Q and a before we move on, everybody has been stunned to silence because we managed to keep our shit together that whole time. I mean, other than Reba's six year old, you know, friend who's just, you know, fascinated and enamored with the word. So it says in the chat. No? Silence? All right. Well, fair enough. We'll move right along. I'm going to start. I've already, as you can tell, I've already started drinking the, uh, the, the our, our wine of the day. So let's get into the formal talk about wine of the day. So the grocery store grab, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is uh, our premise to help people who to get the best value per dollar for wines that are found at non-specialty and non-big box retailers. Okay, we want if you happen to be in one of those people who has who doesn't have uh, access to a great, what, good wine store, whether it's a big box store like Total Wine, Seagull Specs, or Goody Goody, um, but you also don't have even you know a small cool boutiquey spot. You shop at the grocery store either for convenience or out of necessity. One of the things we're going to talk about here on the show is we talk about the strategies to get the best value per dollar because, unfortunately, those environments tend to be up or a little bit higher on the price point. They tend to also be flooded with mass market wines. How do we get the best value out of that? Reward uh, wineries that 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 are really open to wanting to make you a better wine drinker and not just, you know, get your $6 or $10 and then never see you again. So uh, today we are, this means that by the way, we're doing with it, we're doing a label focus. I don't do any prior research on these wines other than what I see at the store. I evaluate them there, put them in my shopping cart, bring them back to you. And we taste them here together online. Uh, so we're, we're looking at what the label does and we're going to rate how well it's, how well it communicates key information. Then we're going to try the wine and we're going to see how well it's executed, whether it's worth buying again. And is it worth the price tag? So, uh, Tina had questions in the chat because I said it ain't moist and we're acting like adults and drinking right out of the bottle. I love it. Yeah. Just head straight to it. I mean, you know, just grab it by the neck and chug that bottle as like an adult. I, I appreciate your enthusiasm, Miss Halpa. So, okay. So, um, we're talking about the prisoner. No, the fugitive. No, 19 crimes. No, Papillon. No, we're talking about the criminal. Why is there a thing with this? So um, I have seen this wine several times. It is one, I'm, we're going to go on a brief rant here about lookalike wines. Uh, one of the most popular wines in the last, I don't know, 10 years, it was Oren Swift's The Prisoner, a Zinfandel-based red blend that swept through Napa's cult community into the restaurant world and now is the poster child for people who don't know a lot about wine who want to drink, drink expensive wine. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little pejorative about it here. And I want to say this, right. A, I love the product. B, I love the product when it was Orrin Swift before it became the prisoner wine company and C it's good, but it is not these, it is not the end all be all of the world of Napa wines. And that's unfortunately this little following and cult that it's got around it. But the damn thing is so friggin' popular that there are all these knockoff brands that follow along in the footsteps. And I hate this as a marketing technique. I hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it, hate it. I hate it because most people who are in the world of wine who are not professionals, who are just drinking to enjoy the beverage and are trying and have heard, have had something and are trying to find it again and don't keep written records or, or, or digital records of their wine drinking experiences, will have trouble recalling 
what that really great wine is that they had. And so they go into the store and either they try and remember on their own or they get assistance from a, from a, from a helpful store uh, personnel and they try and recall the name and they go, oh, it's something about, you know, and it's, is it a prisoner, a criminal, a fugitive, a guy on death row? What's the, all of these things run together in their minds and they're just specifically designed to get somebody to buy something they didn't actually intend to buy. And I don't like that. Despite the fact that the product inside might be perfectly credible have your own fucking ideas. It's okay. Try one out. I mean, I, call me. I'll give you something. You want to name your wines? I will gladly provide you new and fun names for your wines. But the fact is, whether there is, no matter how clever this label is, and I do love it, it is, it is very clever. It is still trying to be something it isn't. It's a red blend. It's from Sonoma, not Napa. But it's riding that coattail. I don't like it. Uh, so, I mean, I don't like the marketing approach. So, I, but I wanted to give it a fair shake as to say like, look, what's in the bottle? We may, uh, particularly mock the fact that, so on the front, basically it's got your, it's got a, it's got an eye catcher of a label with very little information. It just says, uh, Red Valley, Sonoma County, Dry Creek. Okay. So it's telling you where the wine is from, that it is a red blend and it's its name. Technically that's not much less than most folks do. Now, the back of the label, I will show you guys this, is very clever. It's, re it's basically designed to look like some sort of government form that you're filling in with the name, and, and it's got you know, all this other date information. And so it's, like, it's integrated in some things very cleverly, including the request for record check for The Criminal, cellared and bottled by Truett Hurst in Healdsburg, California. Its size, 750 mils. Its alcohol by volume is 15.6% because, damn, you needed to have me walloped upside the head with your ABV. Um, it, it's, it contains red wine. Now, here's its description. This would be normally where we, you would catch the marketing text for any given wine. Um, and again, the puns are theirs, not mine. So I ask your forgiveness now. Killer. Inky dark hue with a battery of caramel and vanilla oak spice aromas that lead an assault of ripe Bing cherry fruit on the palate. A guilty pleasure. The wine is full flavored, but approachable now. Great with bread and water or your favorite last meal. Yeah. Okay. So... That basically doesn't tell me about a lot about what's in the bottle. Um, this is a red blend from Dry Creek, which is one of my favorite areas in, in Sonoma, next to Alexander Valley. Uh, and, but here's the deal. You're a red blend, and you don't tell me what the hell of grapes you put in it. Why not? All you're trying to do now is basically to get me to rely on your label as opposed to or your brand as opposed to learning what types of blends that I like. Okay, so red blend is not an excuse for no information. So big negative on that part. Um, I get the bread and water joke or my favorite last meal. You're not telling me what food it goes with. Um, the only notes you talk about, caramel and vanilla, don't come from the grape. They come from oak, which suggests to me that you don't know how to use oak judiciously. <laughs> I can do it too. Anyway, um, they're too caught up in their pun thing with, you know, the wine is full flavored. Cool. Lots of things are full flavored. Jalapenos are full flavored. Is that what it's supposed to taste like? Oh, there's no flavor information on this one, right? This is an example where they were too caught up and they're clever to do the right thing by their wine itself. And that is problematic because, again, if all you're going to do is try and sell on your brand, if the strength of your clever, the pro and the double problem there is when you're approached by the prisoner, which is, by the way, a far better wine than this one. And yeah, it's also about, uh, it's a more, it's, it's a price level up um, to talk about price point here. This was listed at $28 before the price, before the club discount, the club discount was $10. So this is an $18 bottle of wine. Now the prisoner usually runs in a 35 range somewhere in there. If you see it much priced over that, you're getting gouged. Don't buy it. Um, so fact is the 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 prisoner wine companies now you know, produce that is it's a little higher up on the scale it's bigger on the food chain it should taste you know it should have significant uh elegances that it that that price point affords it 
this is a good notch and a half down the scale, isn't playing in the same end of the pool, and yet still thinks it's going to get away with just being clever. And that's a point where I'm going, mm, well, good luck to you. Um, I said, there's a reason that this wine's been on the shelves for years and I haven't picked it up. It's because if I want the prisoner, I'm going to drink the freaking prisoner. I'm not going to settle for your $18 version that you pretend is going to be like the prisoner. Um, so there. Uh, anyway, uh, ranting over, let's talk. And we know that, so their label, their label is like maybe a C minus a D. I mean, all they really told me is where it was from. They didn't tell me anything about the grapes. They didn't tell me anything about the flavor. They told me that they use a lot of oak. And then they used a lot of puns. So their label sucks. Bad call. But their wine. Now, I've already had a couple sips, and I can already tell you. Their wine, at least, is not bad. The wine is somewhat credible. Uh, the colors on this are very dark. There's some very high, very high extraction. We're looking into that purple, dark purpley range, very inky. So at least it it was it's color-wise, an inky dark hue was accurate. But uh, again... That doesn't necessarily mean anything about its taste. When we're talking about the layman, we talk about, you know, looking into wine. We want to know what it tastes like as far as uh, uh, fruit and food words are concerned. So this doesn't have those, which is bad. But it is dark, which, again, that that's going to give us that visual impression that the wine itself is going to be bigger and bo more bold and intense, right? Bigger, dark dark colors, uh, good to deal a degree where, you know, you, it doesn't look very clear, Right, you can. You, it's got that nice kind of dark. The more opaque the wine gets, it tends to be the more intensely flavored. So, it's basically visually stating that it's going to be a, a a big bold drink. So, on the nose, uh, but we've got some dark fruit. We got this blackberry, maybe blackberry jam or plum. I want to say maybe in. It's not quite on into into the current range. Maybe blueberry. Um, I'm guessing that some of their blend base here is that it's giving it some of that color and some of that fruit is that they've got some either petite straw, petite verdot in there to kind of um, juicy things up, give it that dark flavor. But um, I, and again, a little hint of that vanilla that they're talking about in the on the bottle, which you know that definitely has that oak sensation to it. Yeah, and then there is a tertiary smell. The more you get in the, the more you get into the into it, the more you're going to get into the the back part of your nose. You're going to start smelling that oak, that very clear new oak sensation. Okay, so the folks that are not into wood, we're going to go back to our taint jokes here in a minute, are going to be a little bit. You know, if you're not into that, this is this is definitely not down your trail. So uh, let's go ahead and take a sip. Okay, um, it's tannin structure, it definitely carries a lot of fruit to it. So it's a fruit bomb, it's a California fruit bomb. It's got a lot more of that blueberry and boysenberry type flavor now that I get it on the palate. Um, the tannins are definitely coating the inside of the front of your mouth, um, but the malolactic fermentation kind of, kind of mutes it out. So it's not overt, but it's definitely a, a, a pretty heavy tannin wine. Um, it's not unpleasant in the fact that it's only astringency. Um, there's a lot of plush fruit there to help out kind of cushion the blow. But then it kind of recedes into kind of a generic dark fruit palette. We've got no real distinction, say, between any particular grape, right? Um, I'm betting that there might be, again, this might be a Zinfandel-based blend, and I would guess that based on the fact that it's in Dry Creek Sonoma, which that's kind of their home. Um, might be a little Merlot in there, for, which is catching those blue flavors, that blueberry, boysenberry thing going on. Um, not a lot of savory to it. Actually, yeah, I mean, there's secondary. There's a little hint of maybe some sage or some rosemary there in the middle. But it just gets beaten around by the by the fruit a little bit. Again, not an unpleasant drink at all. Uh, but it's very heavy-handed. It's very direct. Um, you know, it's the whole assault and battery joke that they want to use on their label. Um, but if you like big, intense wines, this is this is definitely up your up your alley. Um, is it well executed? Right. Um, well, it's not. It is certainly not flawed, and it doesn't. And I, and I don't feel like they're cutting corners 
but I do think they're painting with a very broad brush. They don't have any one thing they want to seem to want to do, except make a big bold wine. Okay, cool. But could you, you know, tell me a little bit more about how and why you're doing that? Is it on style? Well, that's the question. If you were at to ask the, about the prisoner, prisoner's got a lot more layers in it. It's got a lot more elegance. It's got different things of cinnamon. It's got it's got it's got cinnamon. It's got baking spices. It's got a fruit layer. It's got tannins that kind of integrate. It's got way more going on than that, again, to compare this to that. Now, to go across the board with every other, the only one of the other prisoner-based wines, not prisoner or clone, the Clone Wars here wines that we're talking about, um, I've had 19 Crimes, the basic, uh, their basic blend, their red blend, which, again, is a, another layer down the, the, feed, the food chain from this. It's in that $10 price range until it got popular, and now it's gone up. Uh, but it's a, ba I mean, for, for a $10 Australian blend, it's kind of a do no harm. It's not particularly good. It's not particularly bad. It is not something that I would seek out, but it's not something that I would, that would, that I would shun either. This goes into that same thing. So that's, that's the night that's 19 crimes, which again, isn't technically trying to be the prisoner, but it came on right after that whole scene and the whole Australian crimes thing is kind of their dovetail. Now they've got Snoop Dogg on a label and they're doing a California red blend, which I'm definitely going to have to try because well, it's Snoop Dogg. So, although I'm pretty sure they're putting, you know, they're probably putting, you know, THC in my wine and be like a whole different experience. CBD oil for the win, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, um, then you've got um, the prisoner itself, which I've tried extensively. Um, really enjoy that wine. It's great, great, great piece of work. Um, and there's other things that the prisoner wine company does that are well. That's their abstract and their saldo are actually preferable to me than the prisoner. Um, but then you go to Orrin Swift's upper end of his own line, his Orrin Swift's wines, which is also named after a very specific prisoner, and that is the wine called Papillon. Papillon is, uh, to use to use uh, lightly, fucking amazing. Um, but then again, it's a level up a notch even from the prisoner. Um, I have not tried the fugitive which was the other of these in that similar range um, of let's pretend to be something that, although I guess these could all be one part of the same story, whether you were a criminal, then you were on the ch on the run. So now you're a fugitive, then you got caught and now you're a prisoner and you got done for 19 crimes. So there's your whole wine story in a, in a, in a, in a nutshell. But anyway, um, on style, the, the question of on stability, I don't know what style they're trying to be. So I really can't say, is it on style for a red blend? Uh, sure. It's a big fruit hammer from California. Yay. Um, and it doesn't make you remarkable. It's like, you know, last year's Michael Bay action movie. What the fuck ever. Um, is it worth the price tag? No, I wouldn't pay 18 bucks for this again. This is not an $18 bottle of wine. Sorry. And it's damn sure not a $28 bottle of wine. I can get so much better wine for that price point. So it's uh, it's kind of punching out of its weight. And I think they're, they're they've got a little, little pretense to it. I mean, if you want something from Dry Creek, I would point you towards some other specific Zinfandels with a heck of a lot more elegance and form at this price point. Um, if you want to hop the valley, go check out Alexander Valley Vineyards. Uh, their red, their homestead red blend is way better than this, and it's fifteen dollars. So, I'm telling you, I'm afraid this one didn't quite cut the proverbial mustard. It would not. It will not get a buy again. I'm not going to badmouth though. It's not again. It's not bad wine. It's just not a very good criminal. It's one of those dumb criminals that gets caught. So there. All right. Um, Shannon just has just, just for all of that. I, I'm not even sure what I got the one laugh for, but I'll take it. So it is your time for questions. It is Q and A. It is open. To, it is open table um, here at Wine Shark Wednesday. We've got a good right at the 35, 39 minute mark. So we're doing really well. Um, what questions do you have? For moi, about the topic at hand, about any wine topic at all, or for that matter, just any given topic. Because you know, the show lives on lives and breathes on your limited commentary that you guys tend to give me. Because I guess you like turning me on in the background and just listening to me like the television. Most of you are probably doing chores right now instead of drinking like you should be. And I didn't say I'm not, I'm not gonna drink it. It's not a bad wine. I mean, I paid eighteen dollars for this thing. I plan on getting my $18 worth. If I was going to go for food pairings here, though, this is, like I said, it feels Zinfandel-y. Um, you're going to have to have some stuff with some weight to it, though. You're going to have to have some weight. 
I can definitely see that. We're gonna have to maybe a, might 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 go well with some some. Uh, I've got some roast beef that I might try this with, and some hunter style. Okay, Donna's drinking. Well, Donna, what are you drinking? I mean, you come here on Wednesdays to drink with me, and I appreciate that. So, please tell the class what we are indulging in, and it could be your guilty pleasures. It's okay. Jenna Kershaw has a question. If I was tipsy when I started, does that count as drinking like I'm supposed to be? Yes, as a matter of fact, it does. If you arrive at the show having already consumed, you're probably doing it right. So, I mean, the idea that, you know, I mean, and when, now the weird part is that's because I'm hosting the show at 6 p.m. It's reasonable to have showed up already having a little shine to your apple. On the other hand, if the show was at 3 p.m., we'd have to have a little talk. I mean, I do this for a living and I don't, you know, generally day drink. So I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, the Snoop Dogg reference, dude, it's totally. I mean, you know, you know that they're putting CBD oil in there claiming it's healthy. I mean, my other favorite Snoop Dogg reference is the one there's a picture with him and Martha Stewart. And it said only one of these people is a convicted felon. And it's Martha Stewart. It's so awesome. <laughs> just too fun. <sighs> So let's see. Uh, Donna, what are you, you didn't answer what you were drinking. And Shannon asked the question, when do you start your fall pairings? Very good question. Um, as a matter of fact, so the end of August is already planned out through. I was looking at the content calendar today um, because I'm about to start asking the Patreon, my, my lovely Patreon, who are supporting of this me. They're the ones who get to decide the order of which we do pay tastings in. Uh, so looking ahead to my calendar past, uh, August and into the deep future that is September. We have uh, we're gonna do we do two wine styles and two wine plus shows every month now. Okay, so that means that you'll see wine and and one of them is always wine and cheese. So it goes styles, cheese, styles plus, and it just rotates then there over. Um, and then I'll rate I'll, I'll rank them preferentially. Some of the upcoming topics to be voted on. We're going to do Cabernet Sauvignon at the $30 to $40 level. We're going to do grown-up people Cabernets. That's going to be fun. We're going to do white dessert wines. We've got wine and cheese number four. We've got Bubbles 202, which will probably be a champagne exclusive show. Um, we've got, uh, in November, we will definitely be doing a early show uh, earlier in the month, probably two weeks prior to um, Thanksgiving. We're going to do a Thanksgiving topic show. We'll follow that up the next week, the third weekend, uh, the third Thursday or third Wednesday. Oh, man, we have to wait a whole day. I'm going to have to figure out how to get Beaujolais Nouveau a day early. Or maybe I'll just delay the show till Thursday because I do what I want. But anyway, um, so we'll be doing in November, of course, we'll be doing uh, Beaujolais Nouveau and Thanksgiving focused wines. We're going to be doing cheese throughout this. We've got a second Riesling show that's on there, a second Port Primer Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Franc and the Port Primer are tentatively scheduled in October. So we're going to get Port Primer number two, where we talk about LBVs, Portos, uh, Porto Rubies, and Porto Tonis. Um, then we're going to do Cabernet Franc, one of my single faves uh, out there. So there's a lot of topics coming up. And when we talk about fall flavors, Shannon, we'll probably do the Wine Plus shows will be focused in September, October, November, and December. Um, will all be focused around uh, seasonal and seasonal and fall food points. So what we'll get there is 100 percent. Um, you'll not only see holiday seasonal pairings at both Christmas and and Thanksgiving, and you will also see kind of a we'll do a harvest show. I probably want I might do a whole soup episode where we do basically just you know uh, either slow cook or actually we'll definitely do a slow down show. We're going to do a show on braises and stews. And then we'll do a soup show, probably, which sounds like it's going to be a total failure. <laughs> like, dude, because that guy's a total soup show. I mean, that's that's, that's but that's a total different, totally different in, in, insight. Um, so anyway, yes, you will have lots of pairings that will go along in with the season. Uh, I guarantee you, there will be uh, some Wednesday on Wednesday shows. We'll probably have some theme shows specifically around the holidays as well. So. Um, the next, as far as the, the shorts, the, which are, or rather the pre-recorded, uh, YouTube channel stuff, 
Um, I, I, I stopped last, I did not do thought last Thursday work because I had a, I had an inspiration and wanted to get the idea out correctly. So I'm going to do a three part series on wine shark takes, which is basically, uh, wine for the hard seltzer world. And we're going to talk about that same concept or anybody who is into the entire, um, fermented malt beverages, whether it's ciders, beers, wines, whatever. Um, we're going to talk about transitional, basically getting into wine. If those are, if that's your flavor palette, so we're gonna do a little uh, part on that, and then, like I said, we got an idea from uh, earlier today where we're gonna talk about wine for non-wine drinkers. That'll be uh, and again, even wine drinkers will benefit from the show because it's just advice really on how to strategize. If you had a minimal amount of wine you wanted to buy and you wanted to have the most effective options for a home bar, uh, and then we're gonna do a show on when you go out to a restaurant, even if you don't drink wine, how should you approach? selecting wine if you're the host or head of table etc so a lot of fun that's that's kind of the next four months in a nutshell right i mean between now and the end of the year uh let's see so far fall pairings we love snoop we couldn't just got home from work oh, okay are you doing any kind of holiday pairings yes no i promise i'm drinking not the criminal but a nice pinot gris awesome barbara's got pinot gris ahead of the time that's going to be our show on friday pinot gris pinot grigio we're going to do three different areas we're doing uh, Alsace Lorraine, Alto Adige, and the Willamette Valley. All very fun. So, Shannon was like, Thanksgiving wines? Yes, yeah, I've got plenty. Yes, I've got plenty of wine suggestions for you. That we're going to talk about how to approach what your Thanksgiving meal is and how to make good choices. There's a lot of great stuff for that. So, yeah. A Viognier from Brennan's. Very nice. Little Donna and her Texas favorites, I'm telling you, man. So, Harvest show, yes, the harvest show is going to be great. We're going to do, I mean, and and by the way, Shannon, we may be, you know, you and I may be collaborating. I might uh, get some some slow cook recipes from you that we can feature on the show because you know I know that you and your crockpot become as one during those months. So, uh, and tempranillo with turkey. Well, Donna, you were just a bolt again. You're just a go right after it. Okay. You fry your turkey? That's a big question. You know how you prepare your turkey is a big deal in my house. You know you gotta especially by wine world. So Friday show you'll Peter go, well, I'm sorry to hear that too, Reba, but don't worry. Remember you said that's one of those cool benefits about being a Patreon is that you guys can go back and watch the shows on your own and even try the same wines, right? It's the information is all there. So being that exclusive content, there is something that I hope you guys find valuable, even if you can't make the show to get your personal Q and a, so be very cool. So, all right. Um, let's see, where are we? We're doing pretty, we're doing great on time. Uh, but yeah, so other things that are uh, up and coming, that is, uh, as I said, the, the Pinot Gris show is coming up on Friday for the tasting this week. And uh, to remind those that weren't here at the beginning of the show, we're going to start a contest next week for uh, basically, so it's going to be a tag us, share the channel, spread the love uh, for every one of these things you do. You will get entered into a raffle for a free online wine tasting for up to 10 connections, a $200 value for you and your friends to basically have exclusive rights to laugh at yourselves and not put up with the public while I entertain you. So kind of cool. It's not as quite as good as a in-person tasting, but we do still have those available for those of you that are, that are willing to, uh, to make exceptions to your personal space rules and want to have some, want to bring the restaurant to you instead of going out to the restaurant. I am available for personal and private tastings. So we have some excellent summer examples, the grilled show, the brunch show, and the ever popular just Wine Shark 202, which is wine and food pairing. So um, the end of the summer menu coming through with the end of uh, or end of August, and we'll start getting into the fall menus in September. So that'd be kind of cool. So worn out, Reba's worn out a crock pot. My goodness. I'm telling you, that's got to be a thing, right? That's that's way too many church Sundays or or, or, or hot dish. So. And yes, I do get these other ones. Mitch is retracted. <laughs> but I love it. I, I, Shannon, do I even want to know what you said before you retracted? That's going to be great. I love how it's not going to go down. I don't want this going down for posterity. Oh, my stars and garters. Crocktober. That's right. Now, I do have to say, though, as a lovely birthday gift, I received a delightfully beautiful cast enameled cast iron pot that I cooked my first roast in the other day and wildly overcooked it. Uh, but... I am certainly looking forward to basically putting it through its trial and paces come the fall season because I am all a big fan of mastering the braise right now. It's all about that low, slow cook and really layering in flavors, you know. So 
my sage plant outside is is still surviving and if it could would just continue to thrive with just a few more you know little morsels i might be able to get them off there and use them in my next braise so because uh, the basil doesn't do so hot with the braise Bra basil's not for that purpose but sage sage is totally where it's at if i could keep tarragon alive that'd be nice but unfortunately um, apparently, I have some sort of tarragon curse on my herb garden, which sucks. So, Reba's a working girl. Hang on. Look, we're not going to have this whole pun thing go out of control with you being calling yourself a working girl. That is not how. We do not call it the business unless you are earning money from it. So, you are not a working girl. You are a girl who has a job. Thank you, Miss Reba. <laughs> It get, I'm a, but okay. I'm taking you out of context there. I'm a working girl. It gets a workout during the week. Well, one would hope. I mean, if the clientele's right, I suppose every working girl gets a little shagged out for the weekend. So anyway, you did that to yourself. I mean, I know you didn't actually set that up and it's totally not what you meant, but you needed that laugh and there you go. So again, I miss having you guys as a live audience. I mean, this is as live as we currently are, but you know. Uh, when I did the uh, the wine and smoked foods show on Friday, um, my friend Matt has basically been kind of working with me to uh, kind of kind of figure he uh, helping me out in the world of wine and teaching him about wine so that he can work with me and and do and basically have me not be the bottleneck when 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 and if I can get wine chart to a level at such that more there's not enough of me to go around. But uh, he did our smoked pork belly on Friday. It was awesome. But it was all, it was also awesome because I got to go to his house and visit with him and his wife um, and, and another couple uh, who are friends of mine, his, his cousin, uh, Sean, and his wife. And having a rea you know, an audience that actually, you know, you can hear your joke land as opposed to just reading law on a screen is uh, something that's very missed for those of us in the entertainment world, I got to say. We miss you guys completely. Oh, she miss she misspelled Croctober. Oh, well, see, then that makes you think that makes Reba's working girl joke even that much better, Shannon. When you misspelled Croctober or whatever it was, um, <laughs> this again for my kingdom for want of an R. Uh, I love it. This has absolutely been the best pun show of all time. We've had so many good and easy ones, including our guest wine, which really went down the line and gave us all that extra. Oh, too funny. So wine and cheese next time, too. That's uh, for wine and cheese part three. We're going to be delving into some bolder end of the cheese world this time. We're going to we're going to try some some. Uh, some things with some real oomph to them so that we can also do the same thing in the wine world. We've been kind of on the delicate side overall. Well, we went with the kind of went with the Swiss army type a couple of times ago. We're going to see about getting into our, uh, into our bold cheeses for number three. And then of course, number four uh, next month, we'll probably again, start us off on that fall tradition. So we're going to be thinking about nesting and staying in, even though here in Texas, it'll still be 5,000 degrees outside until Oh, I don't know, November. If we're lucky, October. So, and then we've got light white wines for the last show in August. And that, by the way, uh, we're talking about Alberino and Vermentino. And what else did I do? I've already made the, I'm like, I've already made the selections, but I don't remember what my third wine was for some reason. We are doing, what is it? View this thing. I love the power of the computer. I can reference my own materials with near ease. Whereas if I was, you know, that's the downside of standing in front of you, I'd have to go re reference something. Oh, Tokai. We're going to introduce you guys to Hungarian wines. Fun. Yes, Tokai for mint, which is uh, uh, excellent east of the mountains and the Hungarian region. So now you guys are really going to be, you know, into the into the odd ends of the world um, in the white wine world. So that's kind of fun. You feel that cheated out of the summer? I, I get it. I mean, you've been, you, you, Reba. I know you that you've, you've had a personal journey that's been a little hard for the last little while here. So, you know, the fact that you have to. I mean, what the thing is, cheated out of summer meaning you did, are you mad just because we didn't get to have one? I mean, 
you get your own thing. It's it's okay. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to be sad about it. Other than the fact that we're all stuck inside. <laughs> You're right. I feel bad that we couldn't have like a summer grilled show and just film it outside. It's the same thing. I'm with you. But you and Teach have been there for all of us, so it's been very good. So yeah, the Sage Braze, yes. Mother, I shall figure that I shall figure it out. So one of the things I'm also trying to do is I'm also working on having we took the whole rig over to Matt's to shoot the show last time for the first Wine Shark live remote show. Uh, but I'm also working on getting mobile mobily mic'd. So that way I don't, you know, we don't have to be be limited by the distance between me and the camera, which means we can start doing other things like I can do pre-filming shows that are in the kitchen where we can do some cooking combos. Um, it also means that doing the road show itself becomes a little bit easier. So that'd be pretty awesome. Oh, you're just missing, you know, summer in general. And yes, that, that is, you should feel cheated. The, the rest of the world is here with you in the fact that we are all missing all of our summer activities, whether it's floating here, there, or otherwise being on the beach and being the responsible humans that we are and, and staying inside. So I feel you. I feel your pain. But at least we get to join each other on Friday nights. And I, I certainly know that you guys have helped me stay sane during this whole thing because, well, drinking wine by yourself on Friday nights is just sad. But drinking wine with your friends on Friday nights is considered a job now. So there it is. All right, guys. Well, uh, that is pretty much all I have for you guys. We've talked about what's kind of up and coming. Um, you know, yeah, if we're in the kit wine truck in the kitchen for sure, Hops. I'm not, I'm not, I ain't scared. We're going to definitely do the work and show off the wine. In fact, what we might do is first reprise the cooking with wine examples. We'll do some, how do we use wine in the kitchen in the first place? And then we'll just, other than that, it'll mostly be just pictures of me cooking while drinking wine. It's kind of the same thing. So. All right, so in the comments below, I mean, I love you guys' uh, chit-chat and chatter, but of course, if you guys come back after this has been published here in just a few minutes, come back and ask your uh, commentary questions. Have you been tainted? Have you run into corked wine and wine problems? Tell us your horror stories in the comments below. If you like what we're doing, like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, don't forget to uh, drop that and hit that little uh, bell to be notified when new content comes out. And if you like what we're doing, share with a wine loving friend, help us grow and reach more people so we can help spread that wine shark love. Uh, if you really like what we're doing, come and check us out over on Patreon. As I said, we've got exclusive content over there. That's just for the patrons. Plus you get to help guide the content of the channel and put your two cents in so that we can get the topics that you want to see most out here in the wine shark world. So until next time, I want to say thank you. You guys keep swimming in the right direction. And I have been your wine shark. Cheers. Good works. Yes, Laszlo.